Welcome, Dr. Epic here. What we're going to address in this lecture is we're going to continue to apply the lens of scientific archaeology to the archaeological record of the site of Hisserlik, the suspected place of the ancient city of Troy. And again, this is all in service to that question right there, which I am not going to read for a fourth time. And we're now going to go from the 1960s up until the 1980s and into the early 2000s. And that's when we meet that character over there on the upper left. The Boss was what he was called. But we'll call him Manfred Korfman. Because in 1988, archaeology returns to Hisserlik. It returns to the suspected city of Troy. Uh, with a project headed by this German archaeologist, Manfred Korfman, uh, 1942 to 2005, a number of new techniques were brought to bear on Hisserlik. Some very fancy high-tech technology was used. And even though Manfred Korfman died in 2005, his students and other projects have continued forward. Um, and here is uh, their website in conjunction. Uh, he was at the University of Tübingen in, in Germany, and they worked with the old classics department at the University of Cincinnati, where Carl Blagan had been in the 1930s and 40s. And even though the excavations in the 1990s and into the 2000s were very small, they were very, very scientific. And I don't want to steal anybody's thunder. Most of this lecture is taken from Project Troia, the Troia Project. Uh, you can visit them online. They have many different publications, some of which are written by Manfred Korpfman. And I would highly urge you, if you're interested in this stuff, to look up the actual scientific archaeology conducted in the 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s. This is the current understanding of the sequence of Troy. Nine cities, some of which are internally divided. And you can see the map uh, there on the left. It's sort of color-coded. There's both a side view above and a plan map on top, with the colors coordinating to each of the different cities. Troy 1, 2, and 3, these are maritime Troys. Troy 1 was just a small fishing village. It was succeeded by Troy 2, the most important and heavily fortified of the maritime Troys. Troy 2 was this city of these megarons, these columnated noble houses. And in the diagram to the left, you can see that Troy 2 is, is sort of this bright yellow. You can see it from the side and then from above. Troy II is succeeded by Troy III, the last of uh, the Maritime Troys, and that segues into the first of the Bronze Age Troys, Troy IV. This is the late Bronze Age Troy, Troy IV, V, um, VI, and VII. Uh, and Troys V and VI aren't very well known. The largest and most wealthiest and most powerful of all of the cities of Troy was, of course, Troy VI. Troy VI was that huge Bronze Age city that was destroyed in that cataclysmic earthquake. And in the map, you can see uh, Troy VI is actually the uh, kind of the pinkish color. You can see it from the side and then from above. It's, it's literally right on top of Troy II. Uh, and then there's an additional city which was added in, Troy 6H. Uh, Troy 6H is called, it's called a, it's the city of shanties. Uh, Troy 6H was basically the people living in squalor in the ruins of their earthquake devastated city. And Troy 6H is uh, succeeded by Troy 7A, the one that Blagan thought was the uh, Troy of Homer. And in the diagram, you can see that Troy 7A is, it's, 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 it's a little bit of red. It's the dark red. But there should be a lot more of Troy 7A. And that'll come into play later. Remember that. There's not much of Troy 7A left. And Troy 7A was this attempt to rebuild uh, Troy 6. And uh, Troy 7A, of course, was destroyed in a cataclysmic event, what Blagan called a military destructive event. And it was succeeded by Troy 7B. 
Troy 7b is, of course, Balkanish Troy. Uh, and Troy 7b is a, is a completely different people from a com with a completely different religion, completely different culture moving in uh, from the area just north of modern-day Greece. And Troy 7b persists uh, for more than a century, and it is itself destroyed by a cataclysmic fire that, uh, from what we know, seems to have just been an accident. But after Troy 7b, there's a 200-year abandonment uh, in which the city just lies in complete ruins. and Nobody lives there. Uh, and Troy uh, 7b is succeeded by Troy 8, which is Hellenistic Troy. This is one of the Iron Age Troys. And then all the way to Troy 9, which is Roman Troy. And Roman Troy was basically just a tourist destination. It was uh, for Roman tourists who wanted to visit the site of the Trojan War. So you can see very nicely, and, and I believe Troy, um, Iron Age Troy is the light blue Troy. And if you ever visit Hisarlik today, the, the remaining pieces of architecture that you do see, that's Roman and Greek Troy. That's not the Troy of Homer. Now, Blagan tried to clean up Hisarlik as best he could. This is, of course, uh, Heinrich Schliemann above me and the mess he left of Hisserlik on the left. Doing archaeology in Hisserlik is very tricky. It's very complicated. It's very messy, especially now that, um, you know, the, the site is, is a big center for modern-day tourism. And it's very difficult to do archaeology at Hisserlik itself. Um, here's Blagan's reconstruction of the layers at Hisserlik. Uh, and some of these some of these areas are just too delicate to excavate. The areas are just going to collapse, and then the Turkish government gets very mad at you because you made part of their ancient city fall down. So when Manfred Korpfman wanted to return to Hisserlik, he decided to focus not on the area that had been excavated by Blagen or Schliemann. Korfman instead wanted to look at the area around Hisserlik. Uh, it was a really big area. There's an aerial map above, and you can see uh, Hisserlik is in the center. Korfman wanted to look at the area outside of the city. And what Korfman's logic was that often outside of city walls and outside of city gates is where you find these impromptu extramural arguments. And Korfman was interested in the economy of the late Bronze Age. And he had this theory that we're looking at Troy and we're looking at Hisserlik as if it's another Greek city. Korfman's idea was that this is kind of backwards. We need to examine this city not as if it's merely another Greek city, but we need to look at it like it is a Middle Eastern city and has more in common with the Middle East than ancient Greece. So it's a big area. That's what he's interested in. It's a big area. And with his limited budget, he had to rely on something called remote sensing. Now, remote sensing is the use of technology to detect things that are in the ground without actually having to excavate in the ground. And remote sensing could involve anything from aerial photography to underwater sonar to ground penetrating radar. It could be a number of things. And Korfman tried a number of things, including ground penetrating radar, uh, he used a technique called electric resistivity, but he achieved his greatest level of success with what that fellow on the left is carrying, a new technology at the time called cesium magnetometry. Uh, he, he's carrying a, a cesium magnetometer right there. Now, what a cesium magnetometer does is it uses uh, a chamber of cesium vapor. It electrically charges this chamber of cesium vapor to project a small, uh, intensely powerful magnetic field downward. And then what it does is it measures how objects in the ground react to this powerful magnetic field being pushed into the ground. Uh, basically, a cesium magnetometer is a very, 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 very powerful metal detector. It's far more powerful than any metal detector you can buy commercially. Uh, or that you could buy it uh, recreationally. Um, and that's what a cesium magnetometer looks like. It's this big backpack. The, the cesium magnetometer is out in front. 
Now, cesium magnetometry was originally uh, developed for prospecting shallow mineral deposits. They were looking for copper in Nevada originally. Uh, and up above, there's a picture of diagrams on how different types of buried objects will yield different, will, will change the magnetic field differently. It's a magnetic field so powerful that even things that aren't metal will change the magnetic field. Now, cesium magnetometry has been embraced and refined by various governments since 1992, particularly the governments of France and Belgium, for reasons we'll get into in just a tick. Uh, and cesium magnetometers are very, very good at detecting mines and unexploded ordnance. Objects underground yield a slightly different magnetic signature depending on whether they are a big soft midden or a, a hollow pocket or a burial or a brick wall. And of course, concentrations of metal show up extremely well. Up above me is a diagram of how the magnetic field penetrates into the earth. And the technology, again, has been really embraced by France, uh, the governments of France and Belgium, largely because uh, the governments in France and Belgium have a big problems with unexploded ordnance. Uh, Northwestern France and Belgium were the site of three massive wars in basically three generations. You've got all this buried, unexploded ordnance left over from World War II, World War I, and of course, if you go far back enough, the Franco-Prussian War. And so, you know, it's very sad, but every now and again, you'll have just some French farmer is tilling his field, and the rain has brought up some shell fired in 1915, and his tractor plow will clip this shell, and you know, it'll go off. It'll be very sad, but it happens. So they've invested a lot of time in, in this technology, and they've really perfected the technology. And the technology has gotten so good that they can not only detect unexploded ordinances, but they can map some of the military terrain left over from these horrific conflicts. On the left there is a, a map that was produced in France, and it's a cesium magnetometer map of the old trenches from World War I. And as you can see, the cesium magnetometer is so powerful, it can map the filled in trenches. And thus we can actually map these trenches left over from the First World War. Here is the bleeding edge of archeological archeolo technology. And this is where archeology span is now, using really, really high technology to answer questions about the human past. Uh, and the cutting, more than just the cutting edge, the bleeding edge of technology is aerial, ces aerial cesium magnetometry. Uh, right up above me is a cesium magnetometer that's been mounted on the bottom of a drone. But other cesium magnetometers have been mounted on uh, UAVs. Uh, and indeed, the military is very, very keen on this technology. Because apparently, not only can cesium magnetometers detect unexploded ordnance or improvised explosive devices, uh, they can actually fry electronic circuits uh, for timed bombs or mines, and thus are a re may be a really powerful tool uh, to be used by the military. So, Mandarin Korfman decides to use cesium magnetometry to map what's around the mound of Hisserlich. And again, all he's looking for is an extramural settlement, maybe a small market outside the city gates or a small settlement of poor people that couldn't afford land inside the city gates. And that's not what he found. What he found was truly astonishing and it astonished the world because what he found was an entire buried city, a massive city five to six times larger than the central mound at Hisserlich. If you look at this map on the left, Hisserlich is just the blue lines on the upper left. Everything else was mapped by cesium magnetometry by Manfred Korfman's Troya project. Entire things came out of the ground. Streets, city walls, sanitation ditches, canals, entire neighborhoods became visible through cesium magnetometry. And a lot of these cesium magnetometer maps were then placed shadowed on top of images from Google Earth. And the result was a map of the ancient city. The city was absolutely gigantic. 
and all of it was just very deeply buried buried by thousands of years of earth thousands of years of, of bioturbation human activity had buried this massive city exactly like the massive city described by homer now there's manfred korfman on the lower left and right up above me on the left is the map of what we understand now to have been the great city of Troy. The central area, the small citadel that had always kind of bothered Heinrich Schliemann was only part of the ancient city. By far, most of the city lay outside of Hisserlich. This vast city, a walled city, extended far beyond Hisserlich itself, and Manfred Korpfen mapped it all using remote sensing and cesium vapor magnetometry. Hisserlich itself, here's one of our maps of Troy 7a and Troy 6, Hisserlich is merely the citadel. It's the downtown part of the city. The lower city of Troy extended over this massive area and was itself walled. Korfman is still interested in city gates, and he's still interested in extramural markets, but to find them, he's got to go, you know, almost a kilometer away from Hisserlich. So Korfman focuses on the city gates, and in the map over right there, in the map uh, uh, to your left, he focuses on the area that's shaded in black. That's what Korfman excavates. Not Hisserlich itself, but the extended city that he detected uh, with remote sensing. Behold, the gates of Troy. These are the city gates of Troy 7a. And when Manfred Korfman excavated the gates, he discovered a number of interesting things. The gates of Troy 7a are rebuilt versions of the gates of Troy 6, which of course shouldn't surprise us. But the gates of Troy 7a had been sealed. In fact, some of the lesser gates had actually been bricked up and earth had been piled behind the gates. And these gates were never reopened. And as he excavated the gates of Troy 7a, he discovered that Troy 7a is characterized by burnt buildings, by collapsed architecture, burnt rubble, and human bodies. He found bodies, some of which had been, in, some of which had been subject to great acts of violence. People had died in the street, the city had burned, and as the burned buildings collapsed, it buried these traumatized bodies, which were laying unburied in the open street. Furthermore, near the gates, he had found piles of ammunition, which had been stockpiled near uh, the city gates, in particular sling stones. Now, uh, he's German, and thus in, in Europe, they call what we call a sling in America, they call a catapult in Europe. And uh, up on the left, you see the catapult projectiles, the sling stones. And up above me is, is basically how you would use uh, one of these catapults. You'd whip it around and then and cut it loose. And this is actually an open question that I'm not going to answer for you. Why would you pile large piles of sling stones near city gates and then never put them away? Why would you leave bodies in the streets unburied or buried only by burned rubble. What happened to the people of Troy 7a? But Corfman actually finds what he's looking for. He found numerous artifacts and objects that connected the city of Troy, well, if it's the city of Troy, to a vast trading network that largely expanded, that largely extended not to the west, but was really focused on the east. They have this elaborate Bronze Age trading network that stretched all across the ancient Middle East and included the city of Troy. The city of Troy sat along this major trade route and one that tied it more closely with the other cities and kingdoms and empires of the Middle East than with ancient Greece. Now, we have to talk about the ancient Middle East for a second. Because right now we've talked about the Achaeans, we've talked about Troy, but none of this was taking place in a vacuum. Uh, the Middle East had been home to vast kingdoms and empires for thousands of years. And Troy is part of that 
area. And in particular, the whole time that Troy 7 is occupied and the whole time that Troy 6 is occupied, there is this large and powerful empire to their east called the Hittite Empire. The Hittite Empire lasts a thousand years. It was a major empire of the old Middle East. Uh, the Hittite Empire shows up in the Old Testament hanging around with the Hebrew kingdoms. They fight a huge war with Ramses II of Egypt, and the Hittites are a big and powerful empire. And the Hittites kept records of political arrangements. They kept, on the upper left is what one of these, these Hittite records look like. Because the Hittites had a very unusual system of empire. And I'll describe how the, the Hittite empire was organized. The Hittites had their own internal land. Uh, up above me, it's in light green. But what they would do with the Hittite Empire is then surround the core areas of their empire with these allied or subject nations. So they would roll into their neighbors and say, hey, you guys are now working for us and you have to pay us. But in return, if, if you are invaded or attacked, we're going to show up with all of this Hittite army to defend you. In other words, the Hittites were never bordered by any of their great enemies. And if any of the enemies of the Hittites wanted to attack the Hittite empire, they had to first fight their way through, through one of these allied nations. And then they would be met by the main Hittite empire. In this way, the Hittite empire never fought a major war on its own soil, but would always meet the empire, uh, would always meet their enemies. Uh, far away from their own borders. But to run this Hittite system of empire, they had to have a number of set political agreements between themselves and their subject nations. And to make sure everyone understood the conditions of these treaties, they would write them down on clay tablets. And many of these clay tablets have been preserved. So we have these agreements between the Hittite emperors and all of these subject nations. We don't always know where these subject nations are, but they're around the Hittites. And in the recorded treaties of the Hittite Empire, you have a series of agreements between a kingdom that they refer to as Willusa. And Willusa, the kingdom of Willusa, was one of these Hittite subject nations. And in the correspondence, we have Willusa keep sending letters to the court of the Hittite emperor saying, hey, you guys agreed to help us out if we're attacked and we're under attack. You guys need to show up and help us. The Willusans complain bitterly that they are under repeated attack from an enemy that they call the Hiyawa. So Willusa is complaining that it's being attacked by Hiyawa. But there's all sorts of political shenanigans going on inside the Hittite Empire. And the Hittite Emperor never rides uh, to the rescue of the Walusans. Now, this leads to a somewhat complex linguistic argument that has been made by, by a European scholar called uh, Joachim Lactaz, if I'm not horribly mispronouncing his name. And in his book, Troy and Homer, Joachim Lactaz makes an argument that Hisserlich is in fact the city of Troy. And he makes the argument that Troy, Ilium, is in fact Willusa. Now, he bases this argument on a series of linguistic shifts. He studies the language of ancient Troy, a language which was called Luian. And he compares this language to ancient Greek, archaic Greek. And one of the things that happens when you move names of people and places from one language into another is the language, the pronunciation of the name or the place will change. Hence, an Egyptian pharaoh named Khufu will be in Greek, his name will become Cheops. And I actually have a firsthand uh, understanding of this. My name is Keith. And I work a lot in Guatemala, but the problem is, is that in Spanish and in the Maya languages that they speak in Guatemala, there is no TH sound. 
that is that's a that's a sound from Germanic languages. It's not a sound from Romance languages. So people in Guatemala cannot actually pronounce the name Keith. They struggle with it. Most often it comes out like a kip or a kip. And what they're doing is they're translating the TH sound to a P sound. And this is how I am Keith in the United States, but I travel to Guatemala and everyone knows me as Keep. All right? Which is not a bad name. And even the Mayan, uh, the Mayan speakers that I, I deal with in Guatemala, they can't even pronounce Keep. They just gave me a completely new name. Call me uh, uh, Mashiru, which means beard. At any rate, uh, so Joaquim Lactaz looks at how, he's looking at how names shift from one language to another. So he takes the language, so he takes the name Walusa, and he says, how would I pronounce Luusa if I am speaking archaic Greek? Archaic Greek really doesn't have a W sound, and places in ancient Greek always should end in an M. So if I'm trying, if I'm an ancient Greek and I'm trying to pronounce Walusa, I'm going to drop the W and add a U-M on the end. Hence, a Luwian pronunciation of Walusa becomes in Greek, Ilium. And then he makes a similar argument about Ahiawa. He said, well, if I am a Luwian speaker, how am I going to pronounce the area of southern Greece? Achaia. Well, there's no really hard K or C sound, so the closest we can get is an H sound. Hence, ancient, the ancient Greek land of Achaia, whence come the Achaeans, would in Luwian be pronounced Ahiawa. In other words, Willusa is Ilium. The people of ancient Ilium would have never called their city Ilium. They would have called it Willusa. And, the, and they would have never called Achaia Achaia. They would have called it Ahiawa. In other words, Waktim Laktaz makes a very complex and very compelling argument that the Hittite records are a first-hand account of the Trojan War. That when Willusa asks the Hittites for help against the Ahiawans, those are the Trojans asking their allies to the east to aid them as they are being attacked by the Achaeans. In other words, the overwhelming amount of evidence, the archaeological evidence of Carl Blagan, the uh, remote sensing and archaeological evidence of uh, Manfred Korpfman, and the linguistic evidence of Joachim Lactaz, all argue that if there is if there is a Troy of the Trojan War, it would have been Troy 7A. What implications does this have for the treasure of Priam? Does the treasure of Priam date to the time of the Trojan War? Well, it dates to Troy 2. Uh, that's where Heinrich Schliemann found it. So, all right, that begs the question. What was Troy II? Now, again, the first three Troys uh, are collectively called Maritime Troy. They seem to be cities sharing a common culture spread across the northern parts of the Aegean Sea. Now, this early, uh, Troy is fairly large, it's fairly wealthy, it's heavily fortified. And indeed, the central citadel is home not to a great grand royal palace, but to a series of these very large and elaborate megarons. Troy II is much smaller uh, than Troy VI or Troy VII-A, and still a fairly respectable size. Uh, there is our current understanding of Troy II directly above me, and on the upper left, that's what uh, Troy, that's an artistic reconstruction of what Troy II looked like uh, in 2000 BC. This is why it's called the City of Megarons. It's made up of these large columned noble houses discussed earlier. Uh, and here is the extent of the maritime culture. In the map above, everything that's shaded was taking place uh, as part of this uh, main culture. It was related to what was going on down in Crete. Uh, and the center of this culture was not Troy II, 
but actually centered on the island of Lesbos, which is uh, the very big island in the center of the northern Aegean. This is not an area that's going to go to war with the Achaeans. So, there's Troy too. And if Korfman and Blagan and Lactaz are right, how does it relate to the Trojan War? Now, given Schliemann's rapid and brutal excavation techniques, we really don't have much left of Troy 7a. Remember earlier when we looked at that map, Troy 7a is in dark red, and there's almost none of it on uh, Korfman's maps. Because in Schliemann's effort to find the Homer, the Troy of Homer, to find the place that had the biggest and most impressive architecture, he destroyed most of what was left of Troy 7a. In fact, it's often referred to as the second great sack of Troy, committed not by Agamemnon or Menelaus, but by Heinrich Schliemann. If Troy 7a is the Troy of the Trojan War, most of its archaeological record was destroyed by Heinrich Schliemann. There's also some question about where Schliemann actually found the treasure. Uh, he gives a couple different versions of exactly where he found the treasure. Uh, it's, it's in the map above, it's, it's labeled C. And his account goes as follows, uh, and there it is right there. Uh, but the question is, did he find it next to the wall, or did he find it underneath the, the wall, as in a buried room or buried into the foundations? And Schliemann's idea was that this was carried by a refugee from the Trojan War. Is that still valid? Now, uh, uh, on the upper left, that, that's what Schliemann called the Scaean Gate, which is now the ramp for the Citadel of Troy II. And the treasure should have come from an area somewhat to the left of that ramp. This would place it at or near what Schliemann called the Great Tower of Troy. Uh, or, in other words, somewhere near that really great Megaron in the center of the map. So does it really matter if it came inside the wall or underneath the wall or in the foundation of one of these Megarons or under the floor of the Megaron? Uh, Schliemann's notes are very vague. He doesn't exactly say where. Again, he was more interested in smuggling the treasure out of the city in the middle of the night. Um, so what is the treasure of Priam? I mean, here's the wall of one of these Megarons. Um, and, and, you know, and, and Schliemann's quite correct. I mean, it's, it is a very impressive architecture, this nice reddish stone. So it, it seems to have come either at the base of the wall or underneath the wall or maybe underneath the floor of the Megaron. Who knows? So what was the treasure of Priam? Well, was it the treasure of King Priam, the Priam mentioned as the king of Ilium by Homer. And if not, then, then what was it? And can we really tell? Do we have the information to actually know what the treasure of Priam actually was? Now, at this point, you have all the information you need. You have everything you need to answer this question. There it is. What was the treasure of Priam? Did the Trojan War actually happen? What is the relationship between the treasure and the Trojan War? What does a scientific archaeology say about ancient Troy? What was the treasure in antiquity and what did it mean to the ancient Trojans? What does the treasure mean to modern archaeology? And that's the end of our discussion of archaeology and the Trojan War. We're not quite done with this yet because this question about Troy will show up on a test. And on that test, I will see you there.